Amen. All right. It's very good to be here uh, with you all this morning. Today, I uh, appreciate Pastor Anderson for inviting me out here to, uh, to preach to all you. And it's always good being back. It's another home for me. So um, hopefully you're going to want to keep me coming back. I don't know. This morning, uh, I've got a little bit of a fiery sermon. So we'll see how that goes over. I'll, I'll ask you this much, though. Okay. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 13, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So, you know, if you're, when you're hearing the Bible preach, just make sure you hear all of it before you uh, get mad. And then if, if I'm being faithful to the word of God, don't get mad at me. I mean, you have a problem with God at that point. So, um, and, I, and I started out with that verse too, because I'm preaching on shame this morning. And the subject of my sermon, the title of my sermon is, Have You No Shame? And this is something that I've noticed. It's something that First, it kind of just piqued my interest recently. We're going through the book of Jeremiah at, at our church, Stronghold Baptist Church, as our uh, Bible study, midweek Bible study. And we did uh, chapter number three, and there's a verse there in verse number three of chapter three where the Bible says, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a, a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. And, you know, this just this concept is kind of an interesting verse there, talking about having a whore's forehead and saying, well, you, you refuse to be ashamed. And that's, that's what it's talking about here when it's describing a whore's forehead, because a whore is out in the public, out in the open, they're doing what they do, and they don't care. And they don't care who knows it, and it's not anything that they're embarrassed about or ashamed about. They just got this, this forehead that just says, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And they have no shame whatsoever. And in the book of Jeremiah, of course, is a very, I guess you call it a negative book because the Lord is bringing judgment against his people. You know, they're supposed to be worshiping him and serving him. He's giving them all the prophets and all these oracles and, you know, just providing the word of God to them. And he's, he's separated them and they're supposed to be serving him. But of course, they didn't. They strayed away from serving him and got themselves in a lot of trouble. And ultimately to this point to where, they, like as, as collectively, as, as a whole, as a nation, they have this horse forehead that refuses to be ashamed. And that, that happens when people start getting really comfortable with sin. And when cultures start being more tolerant and more embracing of wickedness and sin to the point to where people who ought to be ashamed and, and, and walk around in a condition in which you ought to realize and be like, man, you ought to be ashamed of yourself going out in public looking like that or doing that or you know, committing this sin or this iniquity. But when a whole nation just becomes super tolerant and super accepting of things, all of a sudden the shame just kind of goes away. And just people get emboldened and, and really the opposite of, of having shamefacedness or having shame would be pride, right? And people just lift it up in themselves. I can do no wrong. I don't have anything wrong. I don't have any problems. I'm going to go and do this and I'm going to be proud about it. And we'll get into that a little bit more real soon. But we started off reading there in, Je in Jeremiah 6. And, and remember, and I want you to remember this, is that this is a warning to God's people essentially, right? Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, it's a warning from a man of God to God's people. Now, of course, we know they went after strange gods. There's plenty of people who weren't saved at that time in Israel, but the image, the picture here is God's warning his people. And look, you're saved today. You're in church this morning. You're, you're God's people, okay? And God has the same warnings for us as he has all throughout the scripture and uh, when it comes to, especially when it comes to things that you could do to be ashamed. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6 there in verse number 15. The Bible says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. What happens when you get ashamed? You get embarrassed, right? So, you know, you get caught doing something and then you become ashamed. You're guilty and people have a tendency then to blush, right? Your face gets all bright and red and you're going like, I can't believe I just got caught. I can't believe I just do it, you know. That's what someone, you know, who has the right view on right and wrong and has the right view on things that are appropriate and inappropriate, even though they may be doing something wrong, when they get caught, when they get found out, they become ashamed, they get bright red and get embarrassed, you know, like, like that's, that's at least shows that you know right and wrong, right? But the people who are just, they don't even blush. They go out, they commit iniquity, they commit abomination, you know, that which God 
hates. And they could just do so and not even blush about it. Like, it's no big thing. And, and it gets to the point where they just start endorsing it and just throwing it out there for everyone to see, like the whore who's got the whore's forehead. Not ashamed, not going to blush, doesn't matter to them. And God forbid we would ever get to the point where we would be like that, where you can just live in sin and iniquity to the point to where you just don't even care about it anymore. And, you know, maybe, you know, you're not going to be guilty of some of the things I'm going to be talking about this morning, but there's all different subjects, and I had just picked some through Scripture that literally brings up the word shame. And we're going to look at things the Bible calls is a shame, and we need to make sure that we are set in our own morality, our own standing, our own understanding of what's right and wrong, our own discretion to know when we ought to be ashamed and not get to the point to where just because something's really common, just because a lot of people do it, just because it's how the world is, and no one's ashamed out in the world doesn't mean that we ought not to be ashamed. You know, a great example is back in the day, it used to be a really shameful thing for people to live together that weren't married. Like in, in, in American culture, in the United States of America decades ago, it used to be really frowned upon and looked down upon as a culture, as a society. And why is that? Because it was more of a Christian society, because people looked to the Bible a lot more for their standards of morality. And it used to be a thing where it was like, you wouldn't even want to mention, you had a son or a daughter that was living, even if it was just a roommate, and there wasn't fornication going on, but it's the appearance of evil, that alone was looked down as being shameful, as it ought to be. But that's something that these days, it's just normalized. And almost expected, like, oh, yeah, so where do you, know, oh, yeah, they're not married, they're 35, but they've been living together for 10 years, and, you know, like, and it's just part of normal life, as opposed to the family member you don't really want to talk about because it's embarrassing, because it's shameful. Well, this is the condition that the children of Israel were in in the book of Jeremiah, because it's right before they're being taken captive. God's already really, really angry. And what you'll notice in the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, and I'm not going to go through much of Jeremiah this morning, but God has still has this, this heart towards them to just like, look, just come back to me. Just, just turn back to me. Like, just please, just, just repent. Get right with me, you know, and, and, and I'll still be there for you. I'll still take care of you. And, and over and over again, we see that they say some things with their mouth. They say some things with their lips, but their heart is far from the Lord. And obviously, that's what matters most, getting your heart right with God. You, you, have, you have to know these things, believe these things, and hold to them uh, for it to really make a difference in your life, not just to say them with lip service as a man pleaser. So verse 15, again, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At what time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. The Lord's giving them the right way saying, look, you can't blush. You're committing abomination. You know, th now you're going to fall. Therefore, you're going to fall. Here's what's going to happen. And, and God still, please look, stand in the good ways. Look for the old paths. Like, like do things the way they used to be done here in the Bible and, and God's old ways of doing things, nope, don't want to do it. Sorry, too much of a hassle, too much of a change in my life. Well, guess what? Now they're going to be judged. Even in chapter 8, the verse is literally repeated in chapter 8 of Jeremiah, verse number 12. God's doubling down on this message and making sure that it's heard. Jeremiah 8.12 says literally the same thing as Jeremiah 6.15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Then, But verse 13 here says, I will surely consume them. See, and it, the, the follow-up verse to that previously was, hey, but still, stand in the ways, ask for the old paths, do what's right. Now he just says in verse 13 here of chapter 8, I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaves shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away 
from them. And we have to realize is that when we are living in a way that's so not pleasing to the Lord, yet we still have a heart and an attitude that just says, I don't care. You can expect for God to bring you low. You can expect for God to bring judgment down on you. Okay, now look, this is, of course, talking to the people, the land, the nation, which is absolutely true and totally applicable. But even just individually in your life, you can expect for God, a loving father, to chasten you and to discipline you when you have the heart and you have an attitude that is just unrepentant and doesn't care when you ought to be ashamed of yourself. So let's look at some examples. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is one of the first things that comes to mind of verses that literally say that something is a shame. And there's all manner of things that are shameful. Essentially, any sin is going to be shameful, like any iniquity is going to be shameful. But obviously, there's some things that are definitely going to be way worse than others. And committing abomination and not caring at all and having no shame is just really, really, really bad. Because things that the Bible calls abomination are, 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 you know, it's really extremely hated of God. Even though God does, you know, he hates all sin, but the abominations, things that, that God really just, just gets him really angry those are, those are even worse. So 1 Corinthians 11, this isn't you know, the most important thing, and this is actually phrased more in a question than it is in a statement, but it's still stating a, a truth that's held even naturally. Verse number 13, the Bible says, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And of course, this chapter, verse 15 clearly just says what the, you know, all throughout the chapter, it's talking about a covering, uncovered, covered. Verse 15 says what the covering is. It's hair. It's not a hat. It's not a bonnet. It's not, you know, if, you, if you're wearing a hat and you're, you're praying, you're dishonoring the Lord or anything like that, it's your hair. Okay. And then specifically between men and women, the length of your hair. So if a woman has long hair, it's a glory for her. Her hair is given her for a covering. You can read the whole chapter later, get that in context. But verse 14 says, doesn't even nature itself teach you that? And you know what? Nature does teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Naturally, as an unsaved kid just growing up in the world, you see some dude walking around with really long hair and you think it's a girl. That's, a shame. That's shameful. Right? You're walking behind someone. You see someone with long, flowing, curly locks or something. And then they turn around. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you go out looking like that? You look like a woman, man. And, and hey, the more the culture, the more the world, everything accepts it. Not a big deal. Who cares? No problem. Look, even nature should tell you that that's a shame. And, and look, this, is, this is just a warm-up. This is, this is not, you know, because look, that's an, you, know, you know what? That's an easy fix. I mean, isn't that an easy fix? Just get a haircut. Done. Done. Like, you want to start getting sin out of your life? You want to start getting righteous? You want to be a little more godly? Like, how, e how much easier can you get than just like, ch -ch -ch -ch. all right, we're done. We're good. Next. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 16. This is a big one. And this is a big one. And this one, this, this drove me nuts. And it's not just here, but it's this time of year. You know, but coming out here and, and, and you know, staying at the hotel and, and you know, good night. I, I, this, this got me fired up for this whole weekend. <laughs> People need to realize that nakedness is a shame. I don't know what happened where people think it's okay to walk around in next to nothing and have no problem with it whatsoever and just put your whole body out on display and think that somehow that's not shameful. And I don't care how often it happens and, and wherever, I, mean, I do care, but that never, never should get in your mind of just thinking like, well, it's okay, I mean, we're at the pool. Well, it's okay, I mean, we're at the lake. Well, it's okay, it's just hot outside. No, no, it's not okay. You know what's okay to be uncovered in your house, like by yourself, you know, whatever, or with your spouse. That's, that's fine. 
not out in public. Revelation 16, 15, the Bible says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, obviously, this has a much broader meaning than just literally our clothes. But the, the, the surface application of just talking about being naked and seeing shame totally applies. And that's how the Bible uses being naked all throughout Scripture. Is that when you're naked, people see your shame because you're not covered. And in fact, turn if you would to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 20. We'll start in Isaiah chapter 20. We'll also look at Isaiah 47. It's people's definitions of words change over time too and, and just the way they understand things like nakedness. Well, Isaiah chapter 20, we're going we're gonna to see a situation here where uh, um, there's going to be a description of people who are naked and barefoot and that that's a shame. And you go to any pool these days and you're going to see a lot of people naked and barefoot according to the definition that we find here in Isaiah chapter 20. Look at verse number two. The Bible reads, At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians, prisoners, and the Ethiopians, captives, young and old, naked and barefoot. Look at this. Even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And I don't, like I said, I don't know what happened. Like, like bathing suits these days on women, they're, they're not, it's not even, you can't even, it's not even fair to call it underwear. It's just like expose the buttocks. Where is your shame? Have you no shame to go out in public just so uncovered that you're like a prisoner being taken captive in Scripture? You know, everyone understood what's going on here when, uh, you know, Isaiah's going around and, and God puts him out there as a, as a sign, as a, as a prophet, naked and barefoot. Yet people are walking around, lounging around and enjoying themselves naked and barefoot with their buttocks uncovered and not ashamed, and not blushing, and not thinking there's anything wrong with it whatsoever. God help us. Turn to chapter 47 in Isaiah. Chapter 47. Because now we're going to get even more specific on what is being referred to as nakedness. Because what the world will tell you is nakedness is probably just essentially if your genitals are covered, then you're not naked. That's like the world's definition. And just, just apply a little logic then. So, do you, like, if we're just going to say that's all that's naked, well, I mean, if we're, if we're not naked, then we're clothed, we're covered, right? So is it just appropriate then for, I mean, if we were just all hanging out in here and just all we had was genitals covered and that was it? Of course, I mean, it's ridiculous to go out to the store, go anywhere for that matter, right? Like, is that, is that really your definition and you think it would just be okay or fine or acceptable to do that? No, of, of course it wouldn't be. Well, what is the definition? What, where do we look to the word of God to get our instruction on determining, hey, what, when is it that I'm called, well, considered naked in God's eyes? Because, you know, that's a pretty important line and distinction that we want to be able to make. We don't want to falsely be able to say, oh, no, I'm just fine. I'm not naked. But God still looks at you and says, no, you're naked. Because that's what people do today. That's, what, that's what's being done out in the world. People seem to have no problem thinking that they're not naked when they are naked according to the Bible standards. Look at verse number one of Isaiah 47. The Bible reads, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare thy, the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. So, obviously, it's still symbolic, but what it's symbolic of is someone crossing a river here, and they're 
making bare the leg and then uncovering the thigh. So the thigh was covered, but as soon as the thigh becomes uncovered, now all of a sudden, hey, your nakedness is uncovered. Because once you get past the knees and start heading up, you're exposing your thighs. And when your thighs are exposed, I would say very clearly here in Isaiah chapter 47, you know, it's not just the leg, but go, you just keep going up the leg, you're crossing the river, keep pulling up. As soon as you get up past the thigh, now, you're, now all of a sudden your nakedness is being uncovered. And, you know, I'm not going to, there's, there's an entire sermon you could preach on this. You can go back to the Old Testament, you can see the clothing that was made for the priests to cover their nakedness and went from their loins down and covering their thighs. It, it's, it's extremely clear in Scripture. And I just wanted to make a brief mention of that because... Too many people think it's just fine just because it's hot outside, just because you live in Phoenix, just because it's 150 degrees outside, that you can just get naked in public. And of course, you know what? You ought to be, you ought to be concerned and care. And, you know, I would say this is also a pretty natural thing, too. My children, I mean, except when they're really, really little and just like totally innocent, and they don't care and they're just running around naked like, like it's no big deal. But once they hit that age where they start to realize, like, I'm unclothed, even little kids, you don't really have to be taught that you don't want people seeing you naked, right? And they naturally will be trying to cover up and, and going in a room and shutting doors and going, you know, like, hey, don't come in the bathroom, all this stuff. Because it's just, it's built into us. And people have to overcome that instinct by just the normalization of people just being naked in public. Well, you know what? As Christians, we ought to say, no. Say, where is your shame? And not participate in all the nakedness that's going on out there. And you know what? We ought to have, I believe this too, we, we ought to have high standards. And let's not try to find exact, hey, what is, what is the exact length of clothing that it has to be before it becomes a sin? How about we don't find that exact measurement to our body and just make sure we're covered. Is it really that big of a deal to make sure you're covered? You, you could still enjoy a swimming pool and be covered. You could still enjoy life outside and be covered. And in fact, it's going to keep you from getting too sunburned if you have some clothing, some fabric covering your skin and covering your nakedness. And nakedness is the most sensitive part of your body anyway, so I don't know why you wouldn't want to have it covered up. All right, uh, Proverbs chapter 23. Let's go to Proverbs 23. And I hit on this last time I was here, so I'm not going to go real deep on this, but the shamefulness of drunkenness. Shamefulness of drunkenness. We talk about shameful when people start babbling and just saying stupid things because they've been drinking. Oh man, I don't know how many times myself or others that I know have been totally embarrassed about the things that were said under the influence of alcohol. And you know what? You ought to be, and it ought to be seen as shameful because that's what alcohol is going to do. And look, if, you, if you've never drank before, don't do it. You're going to hear the reasons from other people why they think you should drink and how fun it is and oh, it's just, you're going to laugh and it'll be cool and it'll be fun. But how about you hear the other side of the story? And you can read all of Proverbs 23 later, and especially that, lower, that latter half. But verse number 33 says, Thine eyes shall be old strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Now, I don't know about you, but if your heart starts uttering perverse things, I think you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Perverse, crooked, perverted. There, that's what alcohol has to offer for you. Boy, doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? Yeah, I'm sitting here totally sober today, and I, I just want my heart to utter perverse things. I want my eyes to just behold strange women. And you know what? Hey, I'm going to go around and be around other people that are under the influence of alcohol whose eyes are beholding strange women. And let's just all be part of that culture. Shameful, my friends. Another, another passage regarding the, the shamefulness of alcohol is found in Habakkuk chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. You turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
Habakkuk 2.15, the Bible says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. And, and you know, that's a good warning, by the way, of the people who want to use alcohol to take advantage of people. Like in this context, a man with a man, or probably more frequently, men trying to get women drunk and take advantage of them. And ladies, women, young girls, don't ever allow yourself to be put in that situation where you're going to not be in control of your body and of your mind to be able to um, avoid being, being taken advantage of. Because there is plenty of people out there that that is their intent. Oh, no, let's just have some fun. Oh, yeah, here, here's another, here's another, here's another. Oh, we're having a good time, right? And as soon as you get started, it's going to be that much easier to have more and have more and have more because your inhibitions get lowered. All the things that are going to be firing off in your head telling you not to do this, it's going to get quieter and quieter and quieter. And, oh, no, we're just having a good time and everyone's laughing. And then before you know it, the next day you're going, what in the world did I do? And you're going to find yourself in a situation you never wanted to be in. Verse 16 says, Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. And, I, you know, I'm not going to go into any further context of, of that or description. Shameful spewing, I think, speaks for itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And again, th these aren't in any particular order. I'm not, I'm not going from the least to the most wicked or something like that. We're just kind of bouncing all over the place as my mind was um, coming up with things when I was preparing for the sermon. So 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible says in verse number 34, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Uh-oh. Wait, did I just say that out loud? Wait, wait, I didn't even expound on that. That just said, that just, it just makes a statement in the Bible. How dare you, misogynistic preacher, say that women should keep silence in the churches for it's not permitted for them to speak. Oh, I don't know. I think it's just what the Word of God says. It's what the Word of God says. Let your women keep silence in the churches for it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Why? For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. When we talk about something that is definitely not held in our culture, in our society, in this world, is the fact that God sees it as shameful for women to be speaking in the church. And Obviously, you know, we're talking about during the learning time, during the preaching time. And I would say, first of all, everyone ought to have respect for hearing the word of God. But absolutely, it's not question and answer time for women to raise their hand and start, and start piping up and, and talking during the service. But even though that, that's also the case, I would also say this. If you think that the sermon time is a time to get up and go hang out and have chat time in a mother baby room, you, you know, that's a shame. And I'm not talking about, you know, having to, you know, take care of your kids or something. But when you feel like, you know what, I'm going to go hang out because I know so-and-so is back there and we're going to go have a little chat and I want to talk to her anyways. That's disrespectful and that's shameful. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. where the ladies are instructed to have shamefacedness. Now, it says having shamefacedness, it's not because you should just always be doing something wrong that you ought to be ashamed of. Shamefacedness is, is a quality or characteristic of having discretion and knowing what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and... Um, Look at verse number 9. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, 
with shame, facedness, and sobriety. And there you have the link of the clothing with being, having shame, facedness, right? Because when, when you're putting yourself in clothing that's not modest, that's getting all eyes on you, all of a sudden you're not going to have the same shame. You, know, you ought to have a shame face when you're putting on things. It's going to make everybody look at you and, and, and look at you in a way that is ungodly. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go into detail about this. Anyone with half a brain knows what I'm talking about. Okay, it's the length, it's the fit, it's all of it. Look, do you want to be godly or do you just want to be as worldly as possible? Do you like having guys drool over you or do you want to actually have, um, you know, a godly and a shamefacedness? And when it says sobriety there, it's not just talking about like not being drunk. It's all about being serious and being sober and just, and just having the right mindset of going, no, I'm actually serious about what I'm putting on. I'm serious about how I'm presenting myself. And I'm going to present myself with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly way, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. What is it that you want people to know about you? How do you want to present yourself? Are you going to present yourself in a way that's just going to have people thinking about how your body looks? Or are you going to present yourself in a way that's going to have people think of your works when they think about you and think about the good qualities and godly attributes about you? And look, this is, this is the way it is in this world, ladies. It's the way it is. And you get to choose. How do you want people to know you and remember you and think about you? A lot of that's going to do with how are you presenting yourself? And just know it's a fact. You say, well, it's not right. No one should be lusting after me. Yeah, guys shouldn't be lusting after women that aren't their wife. You're right. You're right. They shouldn't be. But you know what? It's going to happen the more provocative that you put yourself out there too. It's just going to happen. It's a fact of life. Yeah. Turn, if you would, to Jude, the book of Jude. So those are just some of the things. And really, anything that's abominable, anything super wicked is going to be something you ought to be ashamed of. But just, just consider this and think about this. Hey, who, who are you and how do you present yourself? Or what the Bible uses the word conversation. What is your conversation? How is it that you act? How do you behave? How do you present yourself? You know, we're in the world, but we are not to be of the world. Do you have a level of shame? Because when you do something that you know is wrong, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Do you have guilt? Do you blush when you do wrong? Because when you don't, and when things start getting too permissive and just, who cares? Not a big deal, man. I don't know why you Baptists have all these standards and all this stuff. And, and you know, you're so uptight over this stuff. Well, look, because we care and because I want to distance myself and separate myself from the people who truly have no shame and no guilt and no remorse whatsoever because those are all attributes of the reprobate. It's the reprobates of the world that have no shame, that have no conscience, that have no guilt and don't care about anything. That's who that crowd is. And when you start reading Jeremiah, you're starting to wonder and be like, whoa, because the children of Israel are turning into a reprobate nation at that point because they've gotten so bad that God's just like, look, I'm just taking you, I'm just sending you away. I'm giving you a bill of divorcement as it says in Jeremiah and I'm just putting you away. He's like, I did it to Israel and treacherous Judah. The same thing's gonna happen to you. And we see these attributes of the reprobate. Look at verse number 12 in the book of Jude. The Bible says, these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. First of all, they don't even care. They have no fear being amongst God's people. They're not afraid. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Their own shame. They foam out their own shame. You think about the foam on the waves as they crash into the beach and stuff. There's all this foam. Well, the reprobate foams out their own shame. 
They just broadcast it out there, and it's not a big deal for them at all. In fact, Philippians 3, turn if you would to Ephesians 5. I'll read from Philippians 3 for you. Ephesians chapter 5 is where you're going. Philippians 3.17, the Bible says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. There are people who glory in their shame, something they ought to be embarrassed about and try to hide and cover up. That's their glory. And this is what you have with the pride people. Hey, here's the most disgusting, filthy, vile thing that no one would ever, should ever want to have uncovered if it was something you've ever done one time even in your life. You would never want. That would be mortifying for anyone to ever. And they're going, hey, this is what I do. Hey, here's what I'm going to do out in public. Here, accept me. I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of the filthy things that I do. That's the reprobate. That's the alphabet animal crew. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. And they are like natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Hey, here's some standards for you. In Ephesians chapter 5, you know, you're in this world and the world's full of fornication, the world's full of uncleanness, the world's full of, of covetousness. But you know what? Amongst God's people, you ought to be walking in love as Christ loved us. And what does that look like? Well, hey, the fornication, the uncleanness, the covetousness, it shouldn't even be once named among us. It should not be part of who we are. That should not be descriptive of any of God's people. Those of you that are, you know, as become a saint, what's becoming of a saint? Well, not being covetous and not being unclean and not participating in fornication. But continue on here because the verse doesn't end there in verse 3. Verse 4, neither filthiness, look at this, nor foolish talking, nor jesting. And look, these are, this could be an area where it's real easy to just become a little bit out of control and not really have your, your standards up to par when it comes to the foolish talking and the jesting. And especially among the younger crowd, please, pay attention, younger people, because this is an area that's really easy to get out of bounds in your walk with Christ. And I'm not saying your walk with me. I don't care about your walk with anyone else or how you look to other people. I'm talking about how God views you and how God thinks about your behavior and the things that you do when you become too involved with the foolish talking and the jesting, which the Bible says, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For know this, this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Yet yeah, God hates those things. This is why people die and go to hell. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Our behavior ought to be such where we're proving, hey, would God find this to be acceptable? Oh, just lighten up, man. Is it acceptable in God's eyes? And no, we ought not to just be lightening up on things. It doesn't mean you can never tell a joke. It doesn't mean you can never laugh. Of course, we're going to have joy. We have a lot of, you know, but you know what you get the joy from? Wholesome fun. Not foolish talking. And, and how about this? Not joking about things that ought not to be joked about. Not making a mock at sin. You know, fools make a mock at sin. Fools make a mock at sin. 
And when, when you stop treating sinfulness as being exceeding sinful, you're opening up the door to tolerance. You're opening up that door. It starts with humor all the time. How do you think the homos got to where they're at today through media, through movies, through TV? It started them being the butt of everyone's joke. That's how it started. That opened up the door to have fags on the TV screen because, oh, it's okay because we're just making fun of them. It's, they're just a big joke. It's comic relief. And then it turns into, well, no, now, now we want to get more involved in these characters and understand them a little bit more and you know, know where they're coming from. You know? And then it just, once you open up that door, my friends, it's a slippery slope. And then you wind up where we're at today. Or even worse, in the future. I mean, who knows? God forbid. But that's where way we're headed. But look at what the Bible says here. Proving what's acceptable in the Lord, verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Don't be in fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, with the sinfulness and, and just the, the, the sinful, wicked culture of this world. Reprove it. That means tell it's wrong. You know, tell me, no, that's not right. That's wrong. I'm not going to laugh at your stupid, wicked, filthy jokes. That's not right. You ought not to be saying those things. And you don't have to go around and tell people, like, like, before anything even happens, how to live their life. But if you're in association here and you're having people and someone says something, like, you ought to be able to say, you know what, I don't really appreciate that. The unfruitful works of darkness, it says, but rather reprove them. Look at verse 12. For what? It is a what? It is a shame. It is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. The things that the reprobates do in secret, I think that's pretty shameful. You know what the Bible's saying? It's a shame to even speak of those things. So you want to act like you're some stinking sodomite and have conversations and talk about it? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And I don't care if you're telling a joke. You say, oh, what's the big deal? You know what? You start acting like a pervert. You start acting like a sodomite. Shame on you. Amen. It's not funny. Amen. It's not a big stinking joke. Amen. Why don't you prove what's acceptable to Christ? Why don't you be a little bit sober? Why don't you have some shamefacedness and sobriety? Good night. Yes, I'm fired up because I'm sick and tired of seeing our Christians go the way of the world. Do you really believe this is the word of God or not? How important is this book in your life? How important is it? Is it just a big joke? Is it just a big show? I hope not. You know, for some people it is. For some people, they come to church and they'll just, oh yeah, they'll put on the show and they want people thinking well of them and everything else. But when they go home, it's totally different. They're hypocrites. Don't be the hypocrite. You know, the, the children of Israel, the book of Jeremiah, were hypocrites. And what happened to the hypocrite? But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. You're supposed to be a light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Parents, we need to be raising our kids right. I'm going to close on this. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. It's a lot of work to raise child children, right? Especially these days. I, would, I do, and I do think especially these days. And, and the reason why is because of the easy access to the most wicked, perverted filth that's out there in the world. It's so, it's, you know, in the past, it's a lot easier to shelter your children and shelter your family and raise them in a nice, holy, righteous way. But now you've got these stupid devices that can connect to the internet and just bring access in to a child, to an innocent child, to a developing child that. Hey, if you leave them alone, you better believe they're going to get into it. And kids, God bless them, they're smart, but they really like to push the boundaries. And sometimes they're smarter than you give them credit for. And they figure out ways to do things. They figure out how to get in and manipulate and do the stuff that, that you never would have dreamed they can do. 
So parents, the burden is really on you. And, and look, I just brought this up last week or a couple weeks ago maybe. I don't remember exactly when, when it was at our church. And I bring it up because you need to know about it. Because parents need to know what their kids are doing and what their kids are getting into. And, you know, <clears throat> if you're, I'm going to blow the whistle on this. With whether it's, you know, if you know about it, I'm, I'm preaching it to the parents that don't know that kids are going to be using technology in ways it's not intended for. And like, like what just recently happened in my household and what I was aware of is my kids all of a sudden got interested in Duolingo. And I'm happy about that because I want them to learn a language. And I like that. And that re-sparked me to learn language and all this other stuff. But you know what? I pay attention to what they do. And I never even realized you can make comments like, so, look, my kids don't have social media for a very good reason. Well, now they're starting to use the Duolingo that they're supposed to be learning languages on as a chat room. Whoa, hold on a second. You got a bunch of random people that you don't even know making comments in a chat. What's going on here? And then you just start to find out, well, what in the world is being spoken in these, in these comments? It's supposed to be, hey, good job. Hey, congratulations. And then it turns into way more than that. And people who call themselves Christians ought to be ashamed of themselves for what's being said in those comments. And that's something I never want my children to have to see. So guess what? Now they have no friends because it can't be handled on that thing. But you know what, parents? You have to be vigilant and know what is coming across your kids' faces because you never know what's going to happen if you just give them unrestricted access. And I get it. Not everyone is very technologically inclined. And, and you know, if you have <clears throat> questions or concerns about, like, the Internet access and stuff in your house, you can talk to me about it. I'm happy to help you out because I am inclined in these areas. You need the barriers up. The, the things that kids have access to will damage them and scar them for life. It, it's, not, it's not a joke. And like I said, now more than ever, with that easy access, with that ability, and with just, I mean, all the things that you would think, this isn't a problem, this should be fine. Man, be diligent. Don't leave the kids to themselves. I mean, this, this verse just expounds so much more in light of, of all the, the availability and access that's out there today. We need to watch our kids. We need to have standards. We need to lot, not allow the influence of the world that's going to make people think sin's not that big of a deal to know that it is a big deal, to know that you ought to have standards. And you know what? <clears throat> you ought to be ashamed of yourself if you're involved in anything that's wicked that the Bible says is a shame and that we ought to be ashamed of ourselves for. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the instruction you give us from your word. I pray that you please help us. Look, we all have sinned, Lord. <clears throat> but we need to live according to high standards, according to the way the word, your word tells us to, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to internalize all the, the truths from your word, dear God. Help us to, to live them out day to day and that when we do commit things, that we know we ought not to, that we would just be ashamed of it and we would allow that shame to, to give us a, a sorrow that leads to repentance, that we could change our actions, Lord, and that we could just serve you. And we, we thank you for being merciful and long-suffering and for working with us, dear Lord, as your dear children. But please help us to raise the bar and help us not to be so influenced by the wickedness of our world that we would let our own standards to slide. And God, help us with our children, Lord. Help us to be able to keep their minds safe from just the worst degenerate filth that's in the world, that we can at least raise them um, in, in a wholesome manner, dear God, without having to worry about those things. And um, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.